Bruce Seymour. Hey, good morning, church. My name is Mike, and I serve with the worship team. Today we'll be reading from Matthew 8, 5 through 13. Hear the word of the Lord. The faith of a centurion. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. But only say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I, too, am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the kingdom of heaven with the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and to the centurion Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed, and the servant was healed at that very moment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Agape. I'm excited to be here, Pastor Jesse, discipleship pastor. Man, what great worship, great, thanks for reading that scripture. Um, man, life is good. Are you excited? Are you thankful? I am. I, and what we're doing is we're proclaiming God's goodness, His glory. We're going to look at His word. We're going to proclaim the gospel faithfully and accurately to the glory of God. And my hope and prayer is that you leave here changed today. So would you please pray with me? Father, we love you. We thank you for being so good, for the opportunity to worship, for your word spoken to us. And as we look at your word, at your healing, as your interaction with this centurion, Jesus, help us to take it to heart, to change our lives in a strong way so we can glorify you with every day we have here on this earth as we look forward to the hope that we have in heaven only through you, Jesus Christ. We love you so much. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Trying out a new pulpit this morning. We'll see if it works out. I don't know. I've, I've been hurt before, you know, like we'll see if it's God's will that this works out or not, or if I need to transition to other pulpits today. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not you, it's me. Um, okay, so, hey, I'm, I'm Jesse. I, we just recently came off of 22 days of quarantine. Thank you. I think there's a, like a, some kind of badge or, I don't know, but, and I have five kids and we live in one, like one story, so all of my children are alive. And relatively unscathed, yeah, so I think there's some kind of commendation, I'm not sure. Um, But but in that time, as we were sitting there, one thing that we accomplished, air quotes, uh, was that we watched and finished the Marvel movie series thing. Not not the lame offshoot, you know, but like the actual movies. And I thought, what is it about that word? Why Why do they call them, why is that franchise called Marvel? Are we supposed to Marvel at those superheroes, at their abilities. At the, I don't know. You know, Captain America, that's cool, you know, but eventually the whole thing kind of gets a little drawn out. It's fine. Uh, but, but God just kind of laid on my heart, we don't use that word very much. So I wonder where in your life have you experienced something that caused you to marvel? I remember clearly we had the opportunity to be stationed in Germany, and we were down at Garmisch. I bet some of you have been there at the Edelweiss Resort. And a couple miles down the road, there's Lake Ibsee. Right on, the, right on the border of Germany and Austria, and just crystal clear water, green trees, mountains. And I just thought, man, Lord, if this is heaven, great. Uh, it's amazing. I marvel. The fact that heaven is going to be even better than that blows my mind. But I marveled at God's creation and how beautiful it is. I was blown away. When I think of the word marvel, that's one of the things I think of. But uh, sometimes we can marvel at things that aren't as good. We can marvel at the evil in this world, and how awful it is, how astonishing, astounding, how awful people can be to one another sometimes. We can marvel at people's faith in the midst of difficult circumstances. I think specifically about 10 years ago when I was a chaplain stationed at Fort Bragg, we had a family, the Brown family. They had three little girls. They had a fourth on the way, a little boy. Dad was excited, days away from delivering, and found out that he wasn't moving. 
had to deliver him still. And I remember standing there with them at the funeral with this little casket sitting there. And the, the song that they chose was, Yes, Jesus Loves Me. In the midst of that tragedy, in the midst of the epitome of the death and the awfulness that we experience in this world, they had the faith to say, yes, Jesus loves me. I marveled at that. I marveled at their faith. And so the question I have for you this morning is, when do we see Jesus marvel? How can we make Jesus marvel? We, we see it around us, but we think, what is it? How does God, the creator of the universe... Marvel. And marvel is defined as something that causes wonder, admiration, astonishment, a wonderful thing, a wonder, a prodigy. And, and so to summarize today, our main point, if you're with me right now, I want you to hope, I hope that you can take this away, that through Christ we have everything that we need to make him marvel. Everything we need because he gives it to us and it's through him alone. So last week in this miracle series, we saw a chaplain divine. He talked about faith and, and, and Jesus changing the water into wine and how it's important that our lives show a difference to the world and what that means. And so as we're continuing, we're looking at this healing today and what Jesus does here with the centurion. And so the context here in Matthew is that Jesus had just finished his sermon on the mount and he's kind of, okay, he's done. If you remember that, the Beatitudes, beautiful sermon. We'll try to live up to it. It's encouraging. I encourage you to check that out, five through seven. But here, he's going back to Capernaum, and it's kind of his home base there. It's a place where a third of his 33 miracles took place. So he's going home and, and to kind of rest, to kind of reset, to home base, uh, to hang out. And so we see here in verse five, when he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, said, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home suffering terribly. So we write down, marvelous faith begins with calling Jesus Lord. With calling Jesus Lord, not just calling Jesus Lord, but with believing that he is Lord. And, and the centurion says here that my servant is paralyzed. And, and so Luke has a similar account. We'll look at that a couple of times. But it's obvious that probably this is something to do with his nervous system. It could have affected how he breathed and everything going on in his life. He was on the verge of death Constantly, he was suffering. He was basically about to die, and the centurion was worried. And let's talk for a second about what is a Roman centurion? Obviously, a soldier. Uh, we don't have an exact rank like that in our military. The closest thing is probably like a command sergeant major. Command authority, yes, over about 100 people. That's where we get the word century, centurion. But, but this is someone who came up through the ranks. Someone who started at the lowest and just worked their way up. And now he is in a position of authority and influence. Do you think this guy's seen some stuff in his life? They actually had like essentially trials and battles, like one-on-one -on -one duels, combat, one-on-one -on -one to see who lived. He was in battles. I guess he probably did a few things that he wasn't super proud of. I would say he probably had some emotional and physical scars, some hard things. This is someone who was battle-hardened. A command sergeant major, right? What's a sergeant major? Someone who has to enforce the standard, but loves people at the same time, wants to take care of them. This is the kind of person we're talking about in the centurion, and he's used to other people calling him something respectful. He's used to other people showing him respect, showing him honor, and yet he recognizes Jesus as the one who is over him. See, I bet his flesh probably didn't like that, and that's similar for all of us. Our flesh wants to rule ourselves. Our flesh wants to be our own God, our own Lord. And, and, and just like the psalm says, a fool says in his heart that there is no God. So I can do whatever I want. I can be my own God. I can be my own Lord. That's probably what the centurion struggled with sometimes. Our foolish flesh sometimes thinks that we know best. We don't want there to be a God. We don't want there to be a Lord. We don't want to be accountable. At least if God does exist, our flesh doesn't want anything to do with it so that we can be Lord over ourselves. And, and our foolish flesh doesn't understand this, our current state and how awful it is. It doesn't understand God's goodness, his love, his compassion, his grace, his mercy. It doesn't want there to be a Lord. And just like this centurion, sometimes it takes us going through a hard time. Sometimes it takes tough circumstances for us to get to the spot where we finally acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so when are some other times in, our, in Scripture where we see people calling Jesus Lord? Not just teacher, not just good, you know, but, but Lord. I think of the woman caught in adultery, thinking she was going to die, surrounded by people who wanted to get her, who wanted to throw stones at her. Does that sound familiar? You ever been hurt by people sometimes? And you feel like the world just trying to throw stones at you. And yet, what does Jesus say? 
She, well, she says to him, Lord, no one is here to accuse me. And he says, get up, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. She calls him Lord. The leper earlier in this chapter, covered with sores, a social outcast, says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Later in the chapter, the disciples are crossing the lake, scared. They go and say, Lord, save us. They're in desperate situation. They cry out to him and call him Lord. Final example, look at Matthew 25. The Canaanite woman, a social outcast, says, Lord, help me. Sometimes it's the hardest of circumstances that takes to remind us of our role, of our position, that Jesus is the Lord. And the centurion, this command sergeant major, he's hurting and he acknowledges his place. And so the point of this first, these first couple of voices, verses, voices, verses is that Jesus is Lord and marvelous faith acknowledges our rightful place. Next few verses, and he said to him, this is Jesus speaking, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. But only say the word, and my servant will be healed. Now stop there for a second. The centurion was kind of showing his social grace in the sense that back then it would have been kind of like dramatic, or you know, folks folks would have talked about if Jesus were to go in the house of a Gentile, like oh, you're all the Jews would have said, ooh. Now Jesus, realistically, we you you know what he did? He wouldn't have cared. He would have done it because he was there for everybody. But the centurion probably had grace and understanding and understood. Hey, first of all, I don't want to cause that dilemma. But then secondly, I know that you can do it. And so verse 9, for I too am a man under authority with his soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. So write this down, our, our next point, marvelous faith means giving Jesus his rightful authority in our life. His rightful authority. Some of us don't like that. Not just calling him Lord, but our flesh says, who has authority over me? And, and we know that if Jesus is Lord, he has authority. But some of us struggle with that. And I heard a good example from a mentor of mine. He said, look, you know, a good way to help us understand what it means to give Jesus authority over all of our lives is imagine that you meet someone and they say, hey, I can fulfill your wildest dreams in a good sense. I can give you purpose, hope. I can promise you eternal life, prosperity, everything you possibly want, but it's going to cost you. And you say, well, okay, what's it going to cost me? Well, how much money do you have in your wallet? Um, you know, 20 bucks, okay, well, what about those credit cards in your wallet? <laughs> okay, credit cards in my wallet, what about uh, that, that gym membership there? What about that pass? Well, what about those car keys that you have? What about that shirt on your back? And keeps going and going until finally the person says, I've literally given you everything that I have. And the, the first person says, that's right, and that's what you need to do. Now keep it, but I may come and ask for it at any time, and you need to be prepared to give it to me. That's what it means for Jesus to have authority over all areas of your life. That everything you do, if he says stop doing it or doing it in a different way, you allow him to come in and change it and fulfill his purpose in your life in that capacity. Does that make sense? You with me? Are you good, Agape? All right, that's what I'm talking about. It's it's good. We're excited. God's good. Life's good. The sun's out. God loves us. It's good. So, okay. So this authority understood this authority. Uh, uh, he understood what it meant to have authority. He was in the military, and so he said things, and people did it. So he understood the nature of authority. And even there in that time in Israel, he was the Roman representation. Remember, the, the Romans were occupying at that time, and so he represented the state. And so a Roman centurion said stuff, and the only time Jews could do anything was if they had his permission, or if they had Roman authority permission. So he knew something about authority. Collins points out this was so interesting about the personality of this centurion. The centurion's humility is also unusual due to his ethnicity. Roman soldiers were trained to think of themselves as superior to those whom they conquered and presided over. So in the midst of that, he still gets his position in reference to Jesus. And it's so funny as we look at the relationship here between the Jewish leaders present and the centurion. Because <laughs> in Luke 7, in the parallel passage, the Jewish leaders are like, look, Jesus, uh, he's cool. Like, he built a synagogue and everything, so you should, probably, you should probably do what he says. Like, okay, first, Jewish leaders, love you, you, everyone, you know, but He's God, right? He probably knows what's going on. He's probably tracking that. Secondly, he probably doesn't really need your advice or permission. Like, thank you, love you, but understand your role, bro. Like, just get it. Thank you, Jewish leaders. Appreciate you. So Jesus God, ha- Jesus and God have authority in our lives. They have authority in creation. The centurion understand that. And sometimes we can struggle with that. But at the end of the day, that's his position and it's not ours. You can like it, you can not like it, but guess what? 
one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the authority. That's the truth. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what God's word says. But the good part is that it's good news. It's full of grace and love and hope, and that's what we need to be remembered. But authority can be hard. It can be challenging. It can be difficult when it's tied to our most treasured things, things that we love so much that we want to control them, relationships, whatever else it might be. I remember very clearly the first child I was able to be there right after they were born was my soon-to-be 10-year-old, and he was less than a day old. And so I'm just like in daddy bear mode, right? Like I'll, you know, I'm chaplains are non-combatants, but I'm also a dude, right? So <laughs> I'll throw down if I need to. And so <laughs> we were there in the hospital, and there's just certain medical procedures that infants have to go through. And so I'm sitting there with this little baby, and, and I'm just like, okay, you know, excited, nervous, overwhelmed, whatever it might be. And the doctor had to take him and had to do medical procedures. And so they unwrapped him. He just started crying and freaking out. And every instinct in me said, go and help your kid. What are you doing? What, who is that guy? But I had to have faith and understand his medical knowledge and his authority. That even though part of me was freaking out, I trusted that, that doctor knew what he was doing. And so I had to sit back and let him do what was best for my child. And it's very similar with God's authority. We have to trust that he knows what he's doing. Even when parts of our flesh not, don't like it, we still trust in him. God is the ultimate authority. So we have to let go of our pride. We have to trust his promises in the centurion understood that. So this marvelous faith that acknowledges the authority of God, it acknowledges that Jesus is Lord. Verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he marveled, there's that word, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. So we write down, the only qualifier that you need to do great things in Christ is faith. You don't need to be ordained, you don't need a certain level of education, you could have gotten saved an hour ago. And God can still do great things through you. It's amazing when you think about it. Faith for who God is and what he can do through anybody who trusts him and believes in him. And only two instances in scripture where we see Jesus marveling. One's at belief here and one's at unbelief. When he can't do miracles in Nazareth because of their unbelief. That's a different sermon for a different day, but it's interesting to think about. So, so are you with me right now, God? Because we're going to, I'm going to, we're about to dig a little deeper, and I want you to please pay attention because I, th- I think there's something, but I want to like verbal, do the verbal tap dance really carefully. So listen, one huge struggle with people's faith is their definition of great things. All right, so I'm, I'm going to let that marinate and, and sit and season for a minute. It's the definition of great things and what we want God to do and how we define whether or not it's great that causes us to struggle with certain things. So side note, and here's free chicken, right? So, we, so prayer is extremely important. We have a prayer ministry. If you want to join that, see Chaplain Paul, and, and, or you can go to the, the link and click on it and get signed up. Prayer is super important. We need to pray bigger. We need to pray that God can grow, that God can move, that God is with people, that God reaches the lost, that God can reach Camp Humphreys, that God can reach the 70% of folks here. 70% of the folks here on the base are first-term soldiers who are still relatively young, trying to figure life out. They need the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we need to be intentional about reaching them. It's extremely important. It's part of the mission. Part of the reason that we're here is not just to feel better, which we do, I hope, in Christ, but to reach other people. That's why we quote the Great Commission every week. We need to pray big. So when I say great things, that's what I'm saying. Great things, Father, how, how the world defines it, yes, but we're still going a little bit beyond that. So remember, a huge problem with people's faith is their definition of great things. Okay, so stay with me. So if Jesus is Lord, and he is, He has all the authority, and he can do miracles. The series is on miracles. If he spoke the world, if he spoke the universe into existence, if he made the laws of nature, he can, boom, change them. You know, an analogy with miracles is if I get a ball and I kick it and it starts rolling, and a bunch of little mini nerdy scientists, like, are studying the rotation of the ball, and they're like, well, that's a natural law. Well, I can stop it anytime I want because I'm the one that started it going. It's the same with the universe, right? So God can do all these amazing things, and he can do miracles. He can break what we consider natural law with the heart or with just a snap of a finger. He can speak, and it happens. And so if God is so powerful, our flesh screams out to us, God, why aren't you fixing things? 
Why are you allowing me to go through this? Why aren't you fixing the problem the way that I think that you should fix it? Lord, what is going on? And so I answer that with a question. Stay with me, Agape. I answer that with a question. Is God more concerned with your body or your soul? Is he more concerned with fixing your physical pain or your spiritual problem? See, many people in Jesus' time saw miracles, and they still didn't follow him. They saw him do wonderful, powerful things. That's why there's always people around him, but they still would not acknowledge him as Lord, and they still wouldn't submit to his authority. And I've heard people say, well, if God would show himself to me, I'd believe. Nope. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. It's similar to sometimes there are people who their lifestyles lead to heart attacks, and they have a heart attack. And afterwards, the doctor says, hey, you need to stop doing those bad habits. You need to stop eating the way that you're eating. And despite all the evidence in the struggles, they still end up dying as a result of their life choices. Because it's a heart issue, no pun intended with the analogy. But it's a heart issue. So again, is God more concerned with your body or your soul? And there's an interesting juxtaposition here. And I say that word and I annoy myself when I use it because my whole... My whole, my whole life in seminary, people would be like, well, when we juxtapose God's mercy and God's justice, I'd be like, we get it, dude. You went to college. You read a book. We're all really impressed that you were, used the word, right? But it really fits here. It's, there's, it's interesting when you compare what it takes. Boy, this thing rolls. When you compare what it takes for Jesus, right? <laughs> when you compare what it takes for Jesus to heal his, our bodies, snap, speak, healed, and what it takes for him to rescue our souls, which is going to the cross and dying. Are you with me, Agape? It's important that what is he more concerned about? He can speak and feel, he can heal your body, but to, to, to meet the requirement of how awful our sin is and how awful our sin against a righteous God is, he had to go to the cross and take the punishment we couldn't take. What's more important, our soul or our body? So we acknowledge God's authority and goodness, and while we may not like some of the suffering we have, we know it's temporary, and we know that he has a plan in the midst of it. So we submit ourselves to his lordship. We submit ourselves to his authority, trusting that he has a plan. Amen? Did that make sense? Are you with me? Okay, we're getting some awkward silence. I just want to make sure you're tracking, because it's an important concept to get. Because what is Jesus' mission? To make you feel better and feel happy? No. No. To seek and save that which is lost, talking about people's eternity. People need Jesus, especially today. If you would have told me some of the things happening in the world today when I was a teenager, I would have said, yeah, right. People aren't that stupid. Well, it turns out me too, but we're all, we, all are, we are all sinners in need of a Savior. So it's not his mission on earth to heal our pain. It's his mission to come and help us understand who he is and we are sinners in need of of a savior. But our flesh wants this. Our flesh, our flesh says, I want a formula to get rid of the pain. I want an equation. I want God to fix it. I want God to fix what's wrong with me. And that's religion. And I say that with like the, in like the negative sense of the term, right? Religion says that, well, why don't you have a formula? You did enough good works. You did enough things where you made this and this and this. Therefore, God should do that. Our flesh says, what's the deal? This doesn't seem unfair. If I read this book enough, if I say this prayer enough, if I put this oil on my head, then God should do that. We want a formula, and there's three problems with that. We know God doesn't work in formulas like that for our physical, but three problems with that. Number one, it's works-based, so we think we do enough good, then God will. That's works-based salvation, not going to work. Secondly, God's not a puppet, not a cosmic vending machine to hit a button and have him do what we want. And here's the third thing, is that, that we have a formula. We have a formula, but it's about our soul, not about our flesh, right? There is a formula, there is an equation, but it's not for our body, it's for our soul, and that's the more important of the two. What I'm saying this morning, Agabe, is there might not be a guarantee that God will heal your body, but there is a promise that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Which is the more important of the two? Now, we have the promise that your physical pain and all the trials on earth are temporary, and they will go away one day. But right now, the more important of the two is the promise of forgiveness, the promise of mercy, and that is by far the more important of it. Are you with me? All right, that's good. It's, 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 if someone says amen, it's good, okay? I'm just throwing that out there. You can send it back, whatever it is, but I'm just saying sometimes amens are, are good. So I'm verbal affirmation 
you know, words of affirmation, love language, so I'm just throwing that out there, but okay. So Romans 4, 5 says, to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So the greatest miracle isn't the lame walking. It's not the blind receiving sight. It's not, it's not any of the other amazing things that Jesus did, but it's the lost being saved. It's sinners being counted as righteous because of their faith in Jesus Christ. So Jesus, he's, remember the audience, let's get back to the, the, Jesus teaching here in Capernaum. Remember the audience, we have the disciples, we have the Jewish leaders, we have all of these folks going on, and Jesus is teaching them, you guys think you're awesome, but you need to understand that the centurion has the great faith, and through him, great things can happen. And this, where it says nowhere in, nowhere in Israel, we'll talk about that in a second, but the point of this section is that faith in God is all God needs to do great things through you. The last few verses here, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. So we write down this, marvelous faith is a gift of God that is between you and him. Only you can do it. Nobody else can do this for you. Jesus is telling those Israel, the people who thought, we're the righteous bloodline, we're the awesome people, we're the haves and they are the have-nots. He's saying no. None of that matters. What matters is you having faith in Jesus Christ, acknowledging him as Lord, submitting to his authority and living your life in a way that honors and glorifies him. So we see those two groups here. The centurion, the Jews thought, we're better than him. And the Jews who thought they were awesome, and Jesus say, no, it is the centurion, and they're the other group. You can't use anyone else's faith. You have to use your own. I, I, an example of this is I remember one time a soldier being like, well, I used to go to John Piper's church. You know, and, well, I'd love me some John Piper. It's great. He's a profound author. Love him. Love hearing his sermons, his books. But going to his church doesn't save you. Going to Rick Warren's church, any other leader you want to name who claims and preaches the gospel, that doesn't save you. If you grew up in church, that doesn't save you. If you went on a mission trip when you were 12 years old, that does not save you. What saves you is submitting to the authority of Jesus Christ, asking to be forgiven for your sin, and living for him the rest of your life. That's between you and God, and that is what saves you. Can I get an amen? Thank you. <laughs> so, so, so I didn't mean to sound bitter. Did that sound bitter? I didn't mean to sound bitter, really. I was like excited. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my goodness, where was I? Uh, so it can't come from anybody else. And so, so it, now if you're a the theology nerd, which I mean that in a good way, so, so it's, it, it's amazing to understand that faith is a gift of God, right? So when you say, I have so much faith, you know, well, that faith, first of all, you shouldn't boast, but secondly, that faith comes from God so that no one should boast, Ephesians 2. Right? So isn't it just, it's amazing when you try to wrap your mind, mind around, okay, so God is marveling here at the faith of a centurion, yet God gave that centurion faith. But yet, he, yeah, boom, it's because it's all about God. It's, there's things about him that we don't necessarily, can't, we can't comprehend it, we can't get it, because he's God, he's infinite. So to think that a rational being can completely and entirely understand this infinite God is just silly. But it's amazing, and it's good, and it's good news. So God here is talking to the sons of the kingdom, and, and there's a passage later in Matthew, and it, it says, Jesus is saying to the, the Jewish people, to the, Israel, the folks of Israel, he's speaking to them, and he says, therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. That's talking about going from the focus on the mission of Israel and the Messiah coming through that bloodline of David into where it's now the church, and the church's job is to fulfill the mission of Jesus Christ. And this passage also mentions the East and West. All ethnicities, backgrounds, are going to recline, right? Not just Jews, but people from everywhere. You want to talk about diversity and equality, buzzwords we hear a lot. Folks, if you know Jesus Christ, you have a bond deeper than anything this world can offer. And we see this, this mentioning of folks coming from all places to the east and the west. And it's reminiscent of the throne room in heaven, Revelation 5, when people from all ethnicities surround the throne and worship God. That is diversity and inclusion and equality and all those other buzzwords. Because really, why are we all, how are we diverse and how are we equal? Because we're all sinners in need of a Savior. That's what it is to be equal because we all suck. I'm sorry, we all stink. 
<laughs> we are all sinners in need of a Savior. And this weeping and gnashing of teeth is talking about hell, and hell is real, and it's without hope. And the faith of your fathers, the faith of your parents, the faith of your friends is not going to work. It's between you and God. Marvelous faith is a gift of God between you and between him. So as we begin to wrap up, but, but Pastor Jesse, dude, you like barely mentioned the miracle. <laughs> you barely mentioned that Jesus spoke and this servant was somehow healed. Listen, that's the point of the miracles, that the miracles aren't the point. You get it? The, the point of the miracles are to point you towards the Savior and understand his mission and his goodness and his, gra- and his grace and what he wants to do through you. He can go like that and do physical miracles, but he had to go to the cross to save us because we could not save ourselves. Earthly comfort quickly leads to spiritual failure. So let's have a hard time or two to make sure that we stay focused on what God wants us to do. So as we begin to wrap up, if the worship team wants to come up, listen, you have everything that you need today to cause God to marvel because you don't need anything apart from faith. And the God of the universe who spoke everything into existence, at the physical universe, 13 billion light years across, he spoke all of that into existence. And he wants you to acknowledge his rightful place and authority and lordship over your life. So you can get rid of that sin, get rid of all of the messiness of this world and just trust and let him rule over your life. And you can do things that can make God marvel. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you. You are amazing, and you give us the opportunity to have marvelous faith. This is amazing, Lord. We don't deserve it, and yet you still call us sons and daughters when we trust you. Lord, I know people here are hurting and struggling, trying to look for your hand, for your guiding. Lord, I ask you would continue to walk them along that path and speak to them and surround them with people to help them get pointed in the right direction. Help us to be a body who shows your goodness and mercy to this community as we get ready to celebrate your supper, Lord. Help us to reflect on our lives, to get rid of anything that is hurting our relationship with you so that we can live our lives in a way that causes you to marvel. We love you so much, and it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. So we're going to transition to communion now. We are going back to our chaplains distributing communion. So what that means in a second, I'll ask everyone to come forward. Not yet. And and you'll come forward, get the elements, and you'll go back to your seat and sit down, and then I'll lead us together. But it's important to remember that at Agape, everyone who is a baptized believer is welcome to come forward and partake. And that's between you and God. So if you think you're in a place where you're ready to partake, we invite you to do so. You don't need to be a member. You don't need to be of a certain denomination or anything like that. You just need to be someone who follows Jesus Christ. But there is a warning in God's word. There's a warning that says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. That means if there's sin, unconfessed sin in your life and you're just blatantly throwing communion around, you need to make sure you get right with God. Doesn't mean you need to ask yourself if maybe you did something wrong in fourth grade. Don't overanalyze them. Just if there's blatant sin that you're convicted of that you need to confess, you need to get right with God. So take this time and examine yourself. When you're ready, we'll have chaplains at all the tables. Come down. We'll give you the elements. Go back to your seat, and then we'll go ahead and have the elements together. So please go ahead when you're ready and come forward.